These are the men of the Corpo Elite, the elite corps of the Colombia National Police, the anti-narcotics squad. They spend most of their time blowing up cocaine labs in the heart of coca country. But now their main mission is finding the world's most wanted man. A man also indicted in the U.S. on several counts of murder. Pablo Escobar, DEA Director Robert Bonner. The man is a gangster, he's a monster, he's a murderous thug. He is the most powerful, the most ruthless, and the most violent drug trafficker the world has ever seen, bar none. Police say 42-year-old Pablo Escobar started off as a petty thief near Medellin. He soon realized there was more money in selling drugs. Shrewd and ruthless, by the early 80s he'd amassed a $3 billion cocaine empire. He's responsible for more of the cocaine over the last 10 years that's come to the United States that's been smuggled into our country than any other single person. By the late 80s, Escobar, even with all his power and money, was on the run. Pressure from Colombian politicians and the U.S. government led to attempts to arrest Don Pablo. He lashed out with acts of terrorism, including blowing up an Avianca flight in 1989 in which 110 people died. This summer, he was indicted in U.S. federal court in Brooklyn, New York for the murder of two Americans aboard that flight. And the Colombian government says Escobar is behind the notorious murder in 1989 of anti-drug presidential candidate Luis Galan at a campaign rally. He is the world's uh, premier example of a narco-terrorist because he's also engaged in, I think, some of the most vile and despicable criminal acts that we've seen, not just this decade, but during this century. No private life. Uh... Enrique Santos is deputy editor of El Tiempo, Colombia's largest newspaper. Escobar once kidnapped Santos' cousin, the city editor, and held him for eight months. Now the paper's offices look much like an armed camp. Santos says Escobar knows how to use terrorism as leverage. That creates a, a, a collective panic, and that works for him in the sense that people start pressuring the government to negotiate in any terms as long as this terrorism doesn't go on. Last year, the government, exhausted, gave in and negotiated with Escobar. He surrendered, but with the condition that he would build and live in this palatial prison near Medellin. The prison came with its own interior decorator and a wet bar. And believe it or not, this was Pablo Escobar's private cell for 13 months. This was his office, he had a bed, a private kitchen, a jacuzzi. And this cell offered him a view of the city of Medellin, a city he virtually ruled for many years. In that time when he gave himself up, everybody was so thankful that everybody said, everybody said to himself, okay, give him a big TV, give him a special room. But nobody thought it was going to go to that extreme. What was discovered in that, in that prison was really unbelievable. His cell was posh. He had a safe, a secret hiding place. He even displayed pictures of himself as a bandito and displayed his wanted poster. There was also a picture of himself showing some gray from Christmas of 1991. And a photo of one of his top lieutenants known as Popeye dressed in drag. But the coup de grace was Escobar and his son posing in front of the White House. The jail also contained pool tables, motorbikes, a private soccer field, and even a chapel. Among the other things found at this prison was a hidden cabana. If you look carefully underneath the trees there, you can see it. And inside that cabana, the National Police found a well-fortified bunker and a hidden escape route. On July 22nd, police surrounded the prison. They wanted to move Escobar to a more secure jail, but Escobar had other plans. Police now believe he paid off several guards and fled through his hidden escape route into the jungle. The fact that the squad is once again out of jail, once again uh, intimidating and becoming the, the subject of, of uh, political importance is, is very depressing for us. It's been a very big psychological blow for, for the Colombian prestige, for our sense of, of self-dignity that this has happened. Even though Escobar is on the run, he still has time to read the papers and drop off a few letters. Enrique Santos wrote a column about Escobar's party life in prison and was surprised when he got a critical reply from Escobar, handwritten and with Escobar's thumbprint next to his signature. You feel like he's trying to intimidate you by writing that letter? Oh, apparently, yes. It's a psychological intimidation just to have him there because if he's cornered, 
he can have, he can pull out of the sleeve narco-terrorism, car bombs all over the place like two years ago. This is a national police patrol in Medellin. Although these men are on the hunt for Escobar, they still travel in large groups out of fear for their own safety. For in Medellin, the police are also hunted. Escobar alone is believed to be responsible for killing 350 police officers in one six-month period in Medellin. But the man in charge of the hunt for Escobar, Police General Miguel Gomez Padilla, says he will not be intimidated. We have a very curious way of crying for our men, and it's doing our duty. The best homage we can pay our fallen comrades is to look for and to find this fugitive. And the U.S. is helping in that effort, training troops, supplying weapons and intelligence. But Colombian police say what Escobar fears is the recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling, which in effect allows the DEA to kidnap fugitives like Escobar and bring him to trial in the U.S. That's why Escobar threatened to kidnap U.S. citizens this week. The DEA does have a presence here, but it's low profile. So low that the U.S. government won't publicly talk about it. Nobody's going to come out and say, long live the gringo agents that are here. But this country has suffered so much from narco-terrorism, from uh, a person like Pablo Escobar, that I think everybody wants him out of the way. Well, most everybody. But some people actually like Pablo Escobar. Near the village of Doradal, for example, he's hired villagers and built this zoo for their enjoyment. It has rare white rhinos, camels, and statues of dinosaurs. People here love him because they have received help from him, money from him, and he has uh, his people working here. People who is uh, gathering information and passing him that information. A fugitive as deeply embedded in the hearts and minds of Colombians as Escobar is, is hard for any government to root out. Putting him in his gilded cage was about the only success the government could point to. Now there's a lot at stake in recapturing Pablo Escobar. He makes a mockery of the gringos, he makes a mockery of the government, and he spreads out his money among the poor. So all these things combined, he's a, he's a sort of a mixture of Robin Hood and Houdini. You would think the small town of Buena Vista in central Colorado, just east of the Continental Divide, is about as far away from the world of international terrorism as you can get. Well, that's what Major David Bowers of the Chaffee County Sheriff's Department thought. But five years ago, near the summit of this mountain, Bowers began what would become the biggest investigation of his life, after a local told him about some very strange activity on a 100-acre farm in these Colorado hills. Our first initial information that we received was that there was a clandestine drug lab operation here, a methamphetamine lab. That is what we originally began investigating. Bowers never observed any drug activity, but what he did see made him very curious. There were maybe 75 people, including children, living in the camp without electricity or running water, and many were dressed in Arab garb. I don't think that many of the residents of our county in particular were, were prepared to deal with some of the things that they were about to hear about. By now, Bowers thought he'd stumbled onto some kind of cult. So he sat up on the ridge overlooking the compound and watched the group for two years and started shooting videotape. Several times he saw residents exercising and practicing martial arts, even in the pouring rain. See that road grader? He checked that out and found out it was stolen. He heard small arms fire, along with a rumor of a large cache of weapons. That's when we first realized that we had possible domestic terrorism involvement. By then, Bowers knew the group's name, al Fukra, and that they were known to be a radical sect of Islamic fundamentalists. But he didn't know much more, so he began checking around. And just 60 miles away in Colorado Springs, he found Sergeant Bill Lidd. Lid was investigating Fukra and had come across them almost as accidentally as Bowers had. Well, back in uh, August of 1989, uh, some of our burglary detectives were working a, a burglary case of the storage locker unit, uh, and they more or less stumbled across a storage locker uh, over here at A3 that they thought uh, might contain some stolen property in the storage locker burglaries. That detective noticed people hanging around outside this locker one night. Suspicious, he checked with the storage locker company and got permission to open it. 
Inside, he found paperwork which belonged to Al Fukra members in Buena Vista. It is an outline of how to train a Fukra terrorist cell. It includes a directive that urged Fukra members to be knowledgeable of explosives, incendiaries, demolition preparation, and booby traps. Other materials urged members to wage a jihad or holy war. This is a large, well-organized, very secretive group. Uh, they have compounds all over the country. They have a, a very developed infrastructure. And they certainly demonstrated a proclivity for using violent means of bombings and killings uh, to accomplish their goals. And paperwork found in the Colorado Springs warehouse clearly showed their goal was to kill a variety of religious leaders, including the cleric who headed this mosque in Tucson, Arizona, liberal Muslim Rashad Khalifa. It is the, the objective of all the sincere believers to restore Islam to the religion preached by the Prophet Muhammad. As I mentioned in this program, the Muslims around the world are not doing anything correctly. Everything is wrong. The event this speech, as much as anything else, is why al Fukra wanted the cleric dead. Khalifa denounced radical fundamentalism and claimed to be a messenger from God. He demanded a more liberal Islam and even denounced the death sentence imposed on Salman Rushdie. According to Tucson police, intruders broke into Khalifa's mosque on January 31, 1990, stabbed him some 29 times, and left him dead. And we've seen targeting plans where they apparently plan to, to destroy other religious facilities uh, in Los Angeles and other parts of the country. In fact, according to the FBI and other sources, during the last decade, Fukra has been linked to as many as 15 different acts of terrorism right here in the U.S. Those acts include the 1983 firebombing of a Hindu hotel in Portland, the 1984 firebombing of a Hare Krishna temple in Denver, and the 1990 bombing of the Islam Center in Quincy, Massachusetts. Yeah, A3 here. With the information in hand from Colorado Springs and with his own surveillance in mind, by the spring of 1991, Bowers went to a judge and got a search warrant for the Buena Vista compound. In March of 1991, the 15-man Chaffee County Sheriff's Department and more than 80 other officers raided the compound. They found this shack loaded with computers and surveillance equipment. They also found these books, which explain how to build and care for a variety of assault weapons. Operator's manual for a 40-millimeter grenade launcher. They also had intelligence information uh, identifying the names and addresses of key law enforcement officials throughout the state of Colorado and throughout the United States. Bowers had some interesting information, but didn't have any evidence that could lead to an arrest of any of the many American Muslims living here. I don't think anybody has any objection to them practicing their religious beliefs or educating their children under their religious, religious beliefs in an area like this. What Bowers objected to was terrorism, and determined to find proof of it, he went to a judge again in October of 1992, and he got a search warrant for a second raid. One of our search teams uh, stumbled across this bush and observed that it was tied together at the bottom with a piece of rope. They used some of the stolen rental equipment in the case uh, to uh, excavate this uh, particular cavern. And how far back does it go in there? It goes back in uh, approximately 30 feet. This is what police found buried in a hole on the side of the mountain. As the raid videotape shows, some 68 weapons including assault rifles, automatic pistols, and shotguns. All of them fully loaded with Egyptian or Chinese ammunition. What the hell is that? No weapons charges were filed against Fukra members because of the raid, but due to information gathered in Colorado Springs, coupled with the evidence found in the second raid of the compound, six men were charged with racketeering, and the leader of the sect was convicted of conspiracy to kill Khalifa in Tucson. These are deadly devices. They will kill. When the cases went to trial, James Crippen of the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, who'd analyzed the three pipe bombs found in Fuqua's Colorado Springs storage locker, made this demonstration for the court. It shows exactly what one of the bombs and a liter of gas can do. Well, this device, although it doesn't look very impressive, uh, will flat out kill somebody or a group of individuals, depending on how close they are to the blast site. It will destroy a car, it will blow a room up, it will tear walls down, it will blow arms and legs off of people. Three, two, one, fire! Yeah, a hole in the floor. Yeah. Blew it out and down. Following the trials, these two men, Chris Childs and Ed Flinton, remain wanted fugitives. Flinton for conspiracy and Childs for racketeering. This confiscated photo shows the two posing outside the hillside arsenal. 
Soon after, the rest of the Pukra members abandoned their Colorado home. And this is where Colorado investigators say the members of Pukra ended up, on this compound behind us in upstate New York. According to the Colorado Attorney General, this compound is the headquarters for the American Al Pukra movement. For several hours, we observed this compound from outside its well-posted gates. Hello! We stayed outside the compound and tried several times to get their attention. No one would even approach us, but their attorney, who would only talk off camera, says he believes the people living here are not terrorists. But at least one alleged member of Al Fukra, who may have been present at this compound, is linked to the World Trade Center bombing. And according to the Colorado Attorney General's office, there may be 13 other compounds like this one around the country. All across the Midwest, people are digging out and drying out. I just don't see a reason for this at all. Not at all. I mean, the town is gone. I mean, people's houses are gone. If they're not gone, they're destroyed. They can't go home. And I, t I just don't understand why. The basement has to be done first. The wiring has to be all new. The plumbing, air vents, the all has to be new. Hilda Drake, like thousands of others in the Midwest, is a victim of the disastrous 1993 flood. Midwest officials fear she could also become a victim of a man-made disaster. Are you going to get taken? No, I'm not. I'm not going to get taken. They ain't taking this old Indian lady. I've been, I've been around the horn. It's been tried by pros. It's been tried by pros. It's been a month, six weeks of emotional drain and the pent-up desire of people to get back in their homes, get home repair, to help people who have been hurt is just really dramatic and it really makes for a very fervent place for scam artists to come here. I mean, first Scam one, artists are that man-made disaster. Jay Nixon is on the front line of the battle here in the Midwest to make sure victims of the flood do not become victims of con men. Today, you know, we're going to three different towns, dealing with the police and the prosecutors to alert them to the services we've got out there. On this day, he's playing Paul Revere, flying around the state warning people that the con men are coming. Got my McGruff crime dog on there. Good morning. How you doing? Hi. But those who prey on the, the flood victims uh, in an economic sense, uh, price gouging, other scams, false charities, are nothing more than looters. And they're going to be treated by those of us in law enforcement community exactly the same as if somebody came up and bashed in the window and stole a VCR. Nixon says he's getting tough on the scam artists because he knows what they're capable of. He's seen it before. For example, last year in Florida. Hurricane Andrew damaged or destroyed more than 25,000 homes. Millions of dollars were funneled into the area to help the victims. Smelling that money, the con men came, intent on bilking homeowners out of as much money as possible. Who's going to help me? One such victim was Sylvia Rementaria. Hurricane Andrew destroyed her home, so Sylvia and her family spent every penny of their insurance money hiring a contractor. He was supposed to rebuild the home. Instead, he took the money and fled. So a year later, Sylvia and her family are still living in a trailer behind her unfinished home. How are you going to make sense of this? I have no idea. I'm trying to figure it out how I'm going to do it. But it will the get kids done. are living in here? Yes, both kids are living in here, having the fights of their life every day. Are you living a normal life yet? No. Oh, and, and I feel sorry because this is something that disturbed the whole family. It's just we're all so tired and sick of all this. Police say this man is the reason why the Rementerias are still living in a trailer. Alfonso de la Cosa was a Miami contractor on probation for forgery. He repaired one home in Sylvia's neighborhood and convinced Sylvia and 40 of her neighbors he was legitimate. They advanced him more than a million dollars so de la Cosa could repair their homes. He didn't. He took the money and ran. Because I cannot believe someone could do something like this to so many families. It's not just that he ran away with the money. It's that he really ruined our lives. 
Still getting more and more complaints on that. It just it keeps growing and growing and growing. This the problem got so bad, these cops formed a hurricane strike force to catch guys just like De La Cosa. Who's the, who's the foreman? Who's in charge? They've had limited success in catching the con men by conducting weekly sweeps of still damaged neighborhoods. The most important thing they've learned on these sweeps is how the con men operate. Some guy comes in from out of state and says, oh, I can fix it for 25000 when everyone else is offering 50000 Okay, it's a scam. So they go with the low-ball figure because they're going to save some money and maybe put a pool or something because they can get extra work done. And uh, the guy works two days and you never see him again. The level of fraud here nearly defies the imagination. Literally thousands of contractors bilking hundreds of thousands of homeowners. The results? There are a lot of homes like this one that may never be repaired. And as bad as all this is, investigators say it could be ten times worse in the Midwest. Building and Zoning has advised that they have seen loads of contractors actually packing up and caravanning out. And when they were stopped, they said, no, we're, we're heading out to the Midwest now because things are getting too, too hot down here. That stuff is happening. We can, we can be, see the beginnings of it already. And if, I, I just think history will, will attempt to repeat itself unless we're incredibly aggressive. What would you recommend to a homeowner whose home has been damaged by the flood in order not to become a victim? Well, as the water level goes down, they, they can't let their common sense go down, too. And they got to realize that this may be some of the most important economic decisions they're going to make in, in their lifetime. Nixon has been in contact with Miami officials, hoping to keep con men from getting a foothold in Missouri. But he readily admits that the problem may not become apparent until people begin rebuilding their homes. Nixon and others are now looking upriver to Iowa to get an idea of how bad the scams can get. In Iowa, the cleanup has already begun, and so have the scams. Price gouging for items such as water, portable toilets, even lumber have already been seen. But state officials say that pales in comparison to what will happen once these residents get their insurance checks and try and rebuild their homes. When you came in here, what did you see? Mud. There was this much mud and you just had to wash and they were holding my arms to walk me through. For eight days, 72-year-old Hilda Drake's home sat underwater. No sooner had the water receded than she says a con man tried to take her. He offered to rewire her entire house for $150, but she wasn't biting. I didn't know what he's talking about. I said, I'll talk to you later. Oh, you, you knew? Sure, I could tell. Do you think people, fool. Fool? think people here might get fooled? Your mother didn't make a fool of this. <laughs> yeah, I had, I'm the only girl with five brothers, so you know who's the smartest one in my family. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to give up yesterday. You were about to give up? Yes. Yeah. How do you feel now? Good. You do feel good? Yeah. That makes it work. What did you think when you saw water up to your ceiling here? Cried. I cried a lot. I didn't know what I was going to do. I said, I can't clean it again. I can't do it. I'm 72 years old. I'll just have to leave. Unlike most folks, Hilda is lucky. A church group from Canada volunteered to help her rebuild her home. Yesterday morning when we arrived, she was totally dejected. We sit in this bus and wondered what to do. And finally one guy got out with a hammer and he said, I don't care if there's a warning on the house, I'm going to go fix her house. So we just all trailed on down the street and everybody, and we washed worms off of houses that you couldn't get off with high-powered water. We did everything possible. These kids have been wonderful. You bet. Every look, one look of them. Look at that little, look at that kid, little there. kid there. <laughs> he, worked, he worked his little tail off. Why is that no like, tail? But officials know most people won't be as lucky as Hilda. So they're trying to get out the word. Be careful. I tell them to be smart, and if they are victims, get on the phone and call us and, and try to realize that, that the law enforcement community is prepared, you know, with the help of folks like Florida and Iowa and other states, we've learned. I mean, Tuesday morning, September 20th, 1988. Cheryl Coleman and Jerry Weatherby had spent the entire night inside this second floor apartment arguing about their mutual boyfriend. Well, what we had here is a lover's triangle. Two women, apparently 
romantically involved with the same person. Detective and Jack Niemer says sometime after 8.30 that morning, Coleman pulled out a 38 caliber revolver, shot and killed Weatherby on the stairway. Police arrested Coleman moments later. Jerry Weatherby's murder has been forgotten by most, but it still tortures her father. She was just murdered in a condemned house for, for nothing, as far as I'm concerned. And I lay awake nights and, and just wondered and think if I, if I just could have been there to save her, you know. Coleman was tried, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison at Techita Correctional Institution near Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. It is Wisconsin's only maximum security prison for women. It houses about 180 inmates, 25 of which are convicted killers. Cheryl Coleman was one of those 25 until she climbed over a fence and escaped three weeks ago. Tell me about this current fence. It wasn't designed to keep the inmates in? No, it was built in 1933, and according to the records, it was requested in order to keep intruders out. Warden Nona Swatala has worked at Techita for the last 17 years. Swatala was in charge when the prison's most infamous inmate, Lorencia Bambenek, escaped by climbing over a seven-foot fence and into the national spotlight. Your tips captured Bambenek near Thunder Bay, Canada. Now, once again at Techita, Bambenek is rarely allowed outside of her cell. Van Benick's escape in 1990 prompted Wisconsin officials to spend more than $1 million to build a higher fence at Techita. But by September 22nd of this year, construction still hadn't begun. And on that day, Cheryl Coleman decided to climb over the fence to freedom. On that Tuesday morning, Cheryl was working as a cook at the prison cafeteria. She told a guard she needed to return to her room in a different building and make a telephone call. Cheryl then left. What we think happened is that she went in, went up the second floor, went to her room, changed her clothes, came back downstairs, and then went north of the building, went around the north end, and took off through the east woods. After running through the woods for some 200 yards, Cheryl Coleman apparently made her escape attempt good when she came to this fence. Prison officials believe she just climbed right over it and was free. This is the second time in two years an inmate has escaped from this prison, climbing over this fence in this same general area. What residents around here want to know is how and why could this happen again? And it just and it made me sick that she had escaped. It's unbelievable that uh, that two women can just walk out of prison. No one is angrier than Jerry Weatherby's father. He says security at Techita is lax, and he blames Warden Swatala. I would tell her. To, uh, to get off of her rear end and do her job. What's to keep some of the 25 convicted murderers you have here from going over the fence the same as she did? First and foremost, hopefully their desire not to break another law. Secondly, hopefully the staff will be in the right place at the right time and be able to prevent it. And I want the question answered, why was she allowed during her work shift to, uh, permission to leave, uh, ostensibly to go and make a phone call and given that that was done, why was there no follow-up to call the housing unit and say, Coleman's on her way, call me as soon as she gets there, or if she doesn't get there, call me right away? That's what I want to find out. Patrick Fiedler is head of Wisconsin's Department of Corrections. He met with legislator Peggy Krusick last week to discuss security problems at Techita Prison. Krusick, a member of the Criminal Justice Committee, demanded an investigation into security there. When you first heard about the escape, what was your initial reaction? I was stunned. Absolutely stunned. What'd you think? What the heck is going on with our State Department of Corrections and the facility there? Will there be any changes inside the institution to make sure something like that can't happen again? Well, hopefully, um, staff will be more alert next time. Hopefully. Has there been any discipline of staff? No. Plan any? No. The warden at the prison says, no one will be disciplined, nothing was wrong, no additional security is going to take place until this fence is built. Do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with the waiting game. I think there's a lesson to be learned here. You can't only depend on physical security of a building, such as the fence that Cheryl Coleman escaped through. She also escaped through a hole in procedures. 
We tried to ask Warden Switala again about the procedures at Techita Prison. She refused to answer. Still, I mean, it seems, you know, and you know why I'm asking this. Uh, yeah, I'm getting a little tired of it. Yeah, I understand, but you know, the tackle is That's why don't just quit. Yeah, I, no, I know exactly. Less than 24 hours after this interview, I mean, Warden Switala quit. She faxed her resignation letter to Fiedler last Friday afternoon, and he accepted it. Meanwhile, prison officials are looking for ways to improve security procedures at Techita, and construction has begun on the new fence there. It's scheduled to be completed next year. In a country beaten by violent crime, there was one institution supposedly sacrosanct in Mexico, a safe haven, the Catholic Church, respected by the poor, the rich, and even the country's notorious narcotics traffickers. That is, until three weeks ago. On the afternoon of May 24th, Cardinal Juan Jesus Posados Acampo pulled up here in the Guadalajara International Airport to pick up a guest. As he was parked here, federales say some 15 gunmen armed with rifles and pistols, ambushed him. Surrounded by the gunmen, the bishop had no chance, and 30 seconds later, the country's second highest papal authority lay dead. The 66-year-old Posados, the Archbishop of Guadalajara, was elevated to cardinal by Pope John Paul II in June 1991. He was one of the most popular men in Mexico. Cardinal Mahoney from Los Angeles says Posados earned a reputation of being not only a man of God, but a man of the people. He was someone who, for whom reconciliation, uh, healing, bringing people together, for, for whom uh, nonviolence and peacemaking uh, were the hallmarks of his ministry. The Cardinal spent his time in the poorest barrios, giving hope to those who had none. His death is a loss many he helped are having trouble coming to grips with. At the Cardinal's funeral, thousands of people packed the cathedral. Tens of thousands packed this square. And all of them were shouting justice, justice, as President Salinas showed up at the funeral. And all of them asking the same question, que paso, what happened? The Mexican government says that what happened was a bungled assassination attempt by feuding Mexican drug lords. Although the Cardinal was an outspoken critic of these drug lords, he was not the intended victim. The intended victim was this man, Joaquin Guzman Lara. The Attorney General says Guzman is one of the biggest cocaine and marijuana traffickers in Mexico. The hit, reportedly paid for by a consortium of rival gang members, was supposed to take place at the Guadalajara International Airport. Guzman arrived at the airport at the same time and place as the Cardinal, and in a similar car. But Guzman was then warned that heavily armed assassins were waiting inside. He jumped into the nearest cab and took off. At that moment, the shooting started. Guzman got away, the Cardinal was killed in the crossfire. Embarrassed by the Cardinal's death, the Mexican Attorney General has scrambled to convince his country the government is serious about solving the crime. As they were searching for Guzman, the Federales happened upon what was to be a main pipeline of his operation, a thousand-foot tunnel leading from Tijuana to the U.S. Its planned purpose? To transport drugs under the border into California. Thursday afternoon, Mexican authorities finally got a break. They caught Guzman after he fled to Guatemala. Guzman entered Guatemala with five other people. He was arrested by Guatemalan authorities. Now Mexican and American authorities are looking for the rest of those responsible for the Cardinal's killing, including the alleged mastermind, Benjamin Ariano Felix a powerful Mexican drug dealer whom authorities say helped destroy a beloved prelate by dragging the Cardinal into his world of violence. The two things which his life stood for in opposition the strongest, drugs and guns, were in fact the, the two elements that, that took his life, took him down. Cardinal Posadas was the man who taught us that by being open and gracious and generous to one another, we too can change the world. Uh, that evil does not prevail. Las Vegas is a city where anything can happen. In 
this city of magic, a city whose reputation is larger than life, it takes a lot to make an impression. But the crime that occurred on October 1st was a showstopper by even Las Vegas standards. It all happened at the Circus Circus Casino and Hotel. Heather Catherine Tallchief had been a driver with the Loomis Armored Car Company for just a month. That day, she drove to the front of the casino in this van with two co-workers. She dropped them off so they could make their daily rounds filling automatic teller machines. Tall Chief, just 21 years old, stayed alone in the van guarding $3 million. FBI agent Walter Stowe tells us what happened next. Very simply, what happened is when the two other employees came back after putting the money in the, in the automatic teller machine, the van was gone. Much to everyone's surprise, police say Tall Chief simply drove off with the van and the $3 million. No one has seen Tall Chief since, and the FBI says her boyfriend, 42-year-old Julia Save, disappeared with her. And they now believe he's the mastermind behind the heist. He's a pretty mysterious figure, Brian. We don't have much information on him at all, and in fact, we're not even sure that that's his true name. All police are sure of is the heist was very well planned. Save and Tall Chief moved to Vegas just a few short months before she drove away with the money. And when she first began working with Loomis a month before the crime, Save rented this warehouse and put up these signs telling the neighbors he was opening a business there. Police now say that was a cover because two weeks after the robbery, clues led them to the warehouse and what Save left inside. Come here. Police found the van. It say Save, Tall Chief, and the cash were long gone. This isn't something that happens every day. It's never happened to us before. Bruce McGelkey, a manager for Loomis, says even though Tall Chief worked there slightly more than a month, she'd been a model employee. She had gone through a very rigorous hiring process. Uh, that background check had turned up uh, nothing uh, out of the ordinary. In fact, uh, uh, the investigation subsequent to her disappearance has revealed that she has absolutely no criminal background whatsoever. John Smith, a local newspaper columnist, says the theft has captured the yeah, attention you know, it's, it's of funny. Las Vegas. It's, it's difficult to impress anybody who lives in Las Vegas because we're, we're used to big shows and big fireworks and larger than life everything but anytime anyone successfully or at least so far pulls off a robbery of 3.1 million uh, that gets everybody's attention but smith says the most unusual thing about this crime is that the disappearing no, act may have turned street, Save and tall chief into, into local legends ways. i think there's probably a segment of the population steeped in the outlaw tradition that may be a snickering right now and hoping for the best for those folks yeah, I, I, you know, it, this is a crime, let's face it. I mean, and, and it's a serious crime. Fortunately, nobody was hurt, but uh, what we've had is, is, you know, has resulted in, in a very large financial loss. So it's a serious crime. Let's not make light of that. What I would like to make sure is that everybody focuses on who the victims were here. The victims were those four women, their families, they were four very productive, promising women. Jane Store is Judy Becker's sister. Judy was the young psychologist who fell in love with Ricardo Caputo and who became his second victim in 1974. It happened so long ago, and Caputo was free for so many years, Jane never thought her sister's killer would be brought to justice. All that changed last Thursday when Caputo surrendered. Caputo, why did you kill all those women? When I heard the news that Ricardo had been captured uh, was, I guess, a sense of shock, almost disbelief. The most interesting part of this case is not the fact that a self-confessed serial killer turned himself in after many years on the run. It is, however, why he chose to do so, and what has he been doing for the last 17 years. Now I understand the pain that I caused when I did that to those people. But I was sincerely sick. I was not uh, a criminal. Caputo has spoken just once since his surrender to ABC's Primetime Live. He claims that intense guilt and shame forced him to give up a life on the run and turn himself in. I had that remorse in me, and it was so heavy that I couldn't leave. I, I was w walking up in every morning and lying to my family. Caputo claims he is in many ways a victim too. He says he suffers from multiple personality disorders, 
and has three different personalities, one of which was a psychotic killer who heard voices commanding him to kill. They will hound me and they will talk to me and they will say, we want your blood, we want your, your blood is mine. That's, that was the voices I was hearing all the time. And I thought I was, I was possessed by, by the devil. Caputo himself admits he only became remorseful recently because during the last 17 years, while on the run, he says he doesn't remember his crimes. Caputo told police after he killed Laura Maria Gomez in Mexico City, he moved to Los Angeles in 1977. There he married a woman and fathered two children. But after his second child was born, he abandoned his family in Los Angeles, took all their money and moved to Guadalajara, Mexico. While in Guadalajara, Caputo taught English and met Susana Alessandro, whom he married without divorcing his first wife. He then took Susana to Chicago and had four kids by her. He's a lady killer, the most wanted man in America. Shortly after we aired our first special on Caputo two and a half years ago, he took his family from Chicago back to Mexico and finally a few months ago fled to his hometown of Mendoza, Argentina, where he began meeting with attorney Mario Lucas. He came into the city on January 18. He was desperate and wanted to give himself up to me so I could turn him in, with the condition that he could go to a psychiatric hospital. Incredibly, just one month ago, your tips placed Caputo in Mendoza, but before authorities had a chance to act on those tips, he decided to turn himself in. Caputo's attorney, Michael Kennedy, says the tips had nothing to do with it. Caputo surrendered, he says, because of remorse and bad dreams of the four murders. Well, Mr. Kennedy, you said that he expressed some remorse in this case, and you also said that it was an unusual case because the, psych the psychotic behavior at some point stopped. How do we know that it stopped? We don't. We know that based upon what he has told us and based upon a great deal of police investigation that there are no other crimes that they can associate with him and he denies any further criminal involvement. Why and do you believe he? him? I believe him. I found him to be extraordinarily honest, brutally candid to the extent that he can remember. Well, he's had uh, 20 years to think uh, this story up. Uh, I don't believe him and I don't believe that he's uh, stopped. One man who isn't buying Caputo's story is Yonkers police detective Joe Serlak. He investigated the murder of Judy Becker and for 20 years chased after Caputo. In each uh, case, I guess he comes up with some excuse of why he did it. And naturally, the blame isn't uh, on him, it's on the other people. Just yesterday, a judge ruled Caputo is competent to stand trial. Serlak also believes Caputo is lying about having multiple personalities. Remember, Caputo is a man who conned a psychiatrist into letting him out of a mental institution and admits to killing her. Serlak believes Caputo's done everything he could during the last 17 years to avoid capture. He had a hair transplant. They took the hair from the back of his head and they implanted it in the front and it ruined pretty good. So now he has a lot more hair than what he had back then. Uh, he had a tattoo removed from his right forearm, forearm by la uh, laser surgery. Wait a minute. This is a man, let's stop for a minute, this is a man who's claiming that he had multiple personalities, cannot remember the crimes he committed, mm -hmm. yet he goes to the trouble to alter his appearance so people won't mm -hmm. recognize him? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, is, does that point out that his story may be a little suspect? Sure, sure it does. Like I said, it's 20 years out there. I think it's an act. An act or not. San Francisco detective Earl Sanders, who investigated Barbara Taylor's murder, says Caputo should be prosecuted anyway. I think when you get right down to it, a killer, whether you killed personally or you had an out-of-body experience or you did it because some demon within you came forward, we are going to try you and your demons and all of you will be punished for your crimes. Whether Caputo's well-publicized surrender is a cynical ploy to win sympathy among potential jurors or a desperate man's plea for help. Hollywood is already offering money for his story. It appears that Jane Storr's worst fears are coming true. I would certainly hope that in the weeks to come that that doesn't occur, that he doesn't become some sort of cult figure. Um, that, would, that would be a crime unto itself.
because the victims are the ones who need to be remembered here. Our correspondent, Brian Karam, is in Waco right now. Brian, we've been on the trail of Paul Fada, fugitive from the compound. What's going on there and what's new in his case? Well, John, uh, ATF agents tell us that Paul Gordon Fada may be somewhere between Southern California and Las Vegas, Nevada. They thank America's Most Wanted viewers for giving them the tips that may lead to his capture. Meanwhile, we are in the 27th day of this standoff. A heavily armed Branch Davidian cult shot it out with ATF agents on February 28th, killing four ATF agents in the process. They're holed up in a compound that's about two and a half miles behind me. ATF agents today said nothing new in the case. Koresh still doesn't say he's going to give up. He's still waiting he says for a sign from God. Meanwhile, during the day today, we've seen helicopters buzzing the compound numerous times. It's been going on off and on all day long. Also, earlier this afternoon, we were able to see a very large Army tank clearing some debris from the area. ATF officials say they need a clearer line of sight so they can see the compound much better. And also late this afternoon, a cult member himself was seen hanging out of one of the cult compound windows. But so far, ATF and FBI agents, despite this activity, still say they intend and believe this will be a very long siege. Back to Fada. Did he help Korish make that mighty arsenal in there? Yes, ATF agents uh, tell me today that they believe he may have been the mastermind in putting together this arsenal. They believe he helped put together homemade machine guns, helped to turn existing semi-automatic weapons into automatic weapons. There's believed to be a metal lathe inside the compound. They believe that Fada helped put together this arsenal and also that he not only helped put it together but helped teach these people how to use these firearms. They point to the fact that he was gone the day before the shootout with ATF. They say he was at a gun show with his young son at the time. Do they think his son is on the run with him? Yes, not only do they believe that his son is on the run with him, but they believe that Fada now knows he's being tracked by federal agents, so he's hiding out and having his son run errands for him, and they are now looking for both of them as we speak. Thanks very much, Brian.